Alrighty, good morning, good afternoon, and definitely a good evening to everyone here. My name's Nate, I'll go by HockeyBoy and Nate, and today we are going to be discussing the threat for some severe weather uh, into the mid to latter parts of this week, particularly uh, just the mid parts of this week. The latter parts we won't really talk a whole lot. Um, it'll mainly be more or less today, Tuesday, and uh, Wednesday. Um, but before we get started, like to ask you all take the time please be sure to leave a like on this video subscribe if you're new turn on notifications share this with friends and family and on social media follow me on social media uh as well as join my discord server we are doing a class on radar analysis tonight led by yours truly so if you want to partake in that class and learn about how to read radar data whether it's velocities base reflectivity stuff on radar scope or stuff on gr2 analyst you should definitely come and hang out with us tonight. Eight o'clock Eastern Daylight Time in the Twist of Fate Discord server. Don't miss it. Um, also, for you guys who are wondering, yes, this is a second take of this video. I actually wasn't going to do this, but then I just decided to will myself to do it. And I felt like some information, because it's new, some new information has came, uh, came out. Uh, I felt like I had to uh, at least give an update for you all. So, um yeah, let's get straight into the video. Two different slight risks, one here on Tuesday, one here on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about the one today here first. We're also going to be talking about the uh, slight risk for tomorrow as well. But uh, here's our slight risk here for today. The slight risk has actually been extended a bit further north. Originally, it was in Kansas in the video that I uh, had this morning. Now, uh, it includes places like Lincoln and Omaha as well as uh, Sioux Falls. And uh, that actually is what I was watching in a couple of my other videos. I didn't really point it a whole lot out this morning, but uh, there was a lot more convection that is uh, most likely forecasted to spring up into some of the uh, northern plains in the Midwest area. So that's definitely something that we need to monitor. Um, hail risk, a 15% chance has been issued. Uh, that is indicated in the yellow. The brown is a 5%. So a 15% chance or a 5% chance of you seeing inch uh, one inch sized or greater within 25 miles of a point. So some of the places that could see the uh, the uh, most likely chances of you seeing hail uh, includes Omaha, Wichita, Lincoln, Overland Park, and Kansas City. So if you live in those areas, you guys really need to monitor this system uh, tonight for large hail. That'll definitely be more or less a evening to overnight threat. Uh, so that's really one thing that you're going to have to monitor as time goes along. Your wind threat is exactly the same, is in the same areas as the uh, hail risk was. So uh, instead of it just being uh, one inch size hail or greater, now it's winds. So your uh, probability is now uh, 5 or 15% chance of you seeing damaging wind gusts and upwards of 58 miles per hour or above within 25 miles of a point. So something to keep in mind there. And then you do have a smaller 2%. It's very confined into a space, uh, mainly because... There is a lot of capping inversion, a lot of a limiting factor that's limiting these thunderstorms from reaching maturity, uh, from actually blowing up and becoming uh, classic supercells that we talk about on our live streams and what we diagnose. Uh, so a very condensed uh, 2% that uh, now is outside of the Wichita vicinity. It's now more uh, into the uh, central and south central parts of uh, Kansas and, uh, well, South, uh, southern parts of Kansas, south central parts of Nebraska. Moving on to day two here, we have a large slight risk here. Uh, earlier in the video, we saw that uh, earlier, if you saw the video this morning with no audio, uh, we had the 5% that was mainly localized in here. Now it's been further extended uh, towards the north. You'll actually see that tornado risk here in a second, uh, which most likely means that we are going to live stream tomorrow. So if you do want to partake in that, please be sure to turn on notifications if you haven't already because we are known for live streaming here. The videos, this is more or less an extra thing. The live stream analysis is what this channel is all about. That's what we've been built off of and uh, we will continue to do that as long as there is a risk uh, for tornadoes. So uh, before we get into that, hail risk here, 15% chance of hail extends all the way into Springfield, Missouri, all the way down towards the Alexandria vicinity, uh, maybe a bit further more into... Uh, Texas actually near Lufkin. So if you live near Lufkin, Alexandria, Shreveport, Little Rock, Greenville, uh, near Memphis, Jonesboro, Springfield, Missouri, um, if you live in those areas, you guys could definitely see some hail and upwards of an inch, uh, or at least most likely into those areas. Uh, honestly, you could see a chance of some significant hail down in the southern edge of it, 
uh, more towards places like Shreveport. So I would not be surprised if they introduce a SIG risk there. Uh, but it would either be more sporadic hail or more larger amounts of hail uh, within that general vicinity. So something to keep in mind, and I'll go into further details as to why I think that later on in the video. Uh, you also have your 15% chance for wind. Uh, this will be more... Uh, more or less induced into the overnight hours, which is the reason why it was added for places like Mississippi, uh, further east into Alabama. But a massive 15% risk here uh, that includes uh, some places like Memphis now, as well as Jackson, Mississippi, and Jackson, uh, Tennessee. So really something that we need to monitor as this continues to move on through. Here is your 5% risk for tornadoes. This is is what was added originally there was this circle right here for five percent now it's been moved a bit further north into uh places near springfield and east of springfield i actually was uh noticing that on the models this morning i was talking to uh one of my good friends who's going to most likely be storm chasing this event and i told him i said uh, if you go near springfield or a little bit east of springfield maybe even a little bit more into arkansas right about here uh, if you can't make it all the way down to like little rock or uh, near Pine Bluff, that general vicinity, that general area would be fine. And they actually added a 5% chance for tornadoes within that vicinity. So uh, all the more reason why he should go over into that area. If you're asking as to whether or not we'll get that Storm Chaser live on stream, I actually have no clue. I'd have to talk to him about it. I'm not trying to pressure him or anything because his content is his own right. And uh, we shouldn't pressure him into doing anything. But um, I would just like to make this publicly known that it would be an honor to have him on the channel. Um, but yeah, 5% chance that's been extended into places like southern to central Missouri and the 2% actually goes all the way up into Iowa, includes places like St. Louis, uh, goes all the way up into Des Moines. So if you guys live in those areas or anywhere in the brown or green areas, you guys have a chance for some tornadoes. But the people who live in the brown areas actually have a higher chance of seeing those tornadoes. So places like Memphis, Shreveport, Little Rock, uh, Jackson springfield you guys could see it and uh, you need to monitor this and even alexandria alexandria you're on the border of this uh five percent so you really need to monitor that as well all right let's take a look at the models here um luckily we have the luxury of pivotal weather now before it was uh, malfunctioning due to its uh database having issues with the mapping but now since we got pivotal weather back up and running we can actually discuss this event a bit more in depth here so let's uh, go ahead and get into um, the analysis here. Um, we're looking at the 18Z run, which actually, as of right now, goes to 21 hours out, but it updates, uh, it gives an hourly forecast. So that is the uh, that is the good thing about the HRRR model. But we'll see here at 22Z, which is around 5 o'clock in the afternoon here, thunderstorms start to develop eh, just to the east of North Platte, Nebraska. Uh, that'll start to push on through, create a line of storms, which will uh, go to the uh, north central parts of Kansas. You also have some more storms that form uh, just to the east of Dodge City, maybe even over Dodge City. Uh, but that'll eventually push on through, move into central Kansas and become a bit more widespread. You also have a lot more uh, thunderstorms that start to begin to develop uh, across Iowa and Nebraska, as well as South Dakota near the Sioux Falls and the Omaha region at around nine o'clock in the evening so really something to keep in mind that a lot of these uh, sporadic cells could produce some uh spotty hail in most spots some gusty winds definitely some gusty winds um but no chances or not really a huge chance for tornadoes um mainly because there isn't really a whole lot of uh it's not really as conducive as some of these other areas especially around near kansas but speaking of kansas you have these cluster of storms they begin to be a uh, kind of uh Somewhat discreet, although if you call that discreet, then I don't really know what to say. Uh, it's more or less a cluster of storms that begin to form, but you start to have this kind of gust front that develops, uh, this outflow boundary that forces a lot of gusty winds. So I would not be surprised if some of these areas uh, in eastern Kansas, uh, northeastern Kansas, see some really gusty winds tonight and upwards of 60 miles per hour, maybe even 65 miles per hour. Um, but more uh, rain will impact the uh, Sioux Falls area. That'll continue to be an overnight threat. Uh, it'll continue to go near or north of Wichita, but it'll be heading off into the uh, Kansas City vicinity um, by the by uh, past past midnight, I'd say midnight 
right around the 12 30 one o'clock maybe two o'clock hours is when uh, these thunderstorms will begin to move on through and uh, that's when you can see more thunderstorms that will continue all the way uh, into the early morning where you get a little where you will get a little bit of a break before more thunderstorms begin to settle in on Wednesday but they won't be as severe and it'll be a lot colder uh, than it was the day before all right let's take a look at the dew point here uh, the dew point will uh, basically be able to determine as to how moist the atmosphere is typically you want over 60 in order for there to be uh, thunderstorms in general so the 60 dew points would be indicated in the light blue uh, the greens is more or less the 50s so as you can see as time goes along tonight there is a little bit of these blues around here but there it's mainly in the green which means there's not a whole lot of uh, moisture in the atmosphere there is some but it's not it's modest so there's not too much moisture to kick things off although um, up near uh, the Sioux Falls area there is a lot of moisture there so I'm actually uh, thinking that this area might be a lot more of a risk than uh, this area down here in Kansas even though it has a two percent chance for tornadoes but each risk is still something to monitor regardless so yeah if you live in any of those areas that I called out for that could get some severe weather you need to just stay uh, stay indoors have a plan of action just in case you are issued in any sort of warning whether it's flash flood warning severe thunderstorm warning tornado warning you need to be able to have a plan of action just in case um, but one thing that I know I've been getting a lot of questions on and some other uh, people have talked about it is well why there's a lot of dew points over here that's in the 60s why is there no severe weather over there I mean if we take a look back at the storm prediction center go back to day one real quickly take out the city why is there nothing over in Oklahoma here why is there barely any risk for severe storms over here and that is mainly because of there being the limiting factor in place I've been telling you all for the past two episodes two videos or something like that, that there is a strong capping inversion and what that does is that limits energy from getting into thunderstorms and uh, allowing them to uh, basically mature become strong become supercells so let's take a look at that energy first and then we'll take a look at the capping inversion that I was talking about earlier so Here's your energy, your convective available potential energy, uh, or CAPE as we like to call it. Uh, it's basically the uh, difference between warm air rising and the cold air uh, sinking, I should say. So the more displacement in between the two, the higher the amounts of CAPE there is. Uh, the more CAPE you have, the more energy, the stronger the thunderstorms typically get. So this is, uh, CAPE is basically uh, something that helps thunderstorms develop and or allows them to sustain. So that's something to keep in mind uh, whenever I say the word CAPE. You typically want around 2,000 joules per kilogram in order to consider strong thunderstorms, um, but you know you might see um, some thunderstorms that develop even under that. So because we have some areas that are one above 1,000, 1,500, uh, some of the yellows actually say 2,000 joules per kilogram. Like look at this, east of North Platte, there is actually an area over here that has uh, a lot of cape over here, 2,000 joules per kilogram, actually 2,500. 2,500 joules per kilogram. That's a lot of cape. I mean, it's not you no know, like major amounts of cape, but that's a lot of energy for uh, these thunderstorms uh, in this event. But for the most part, the cape stays at around the 1,500 joule per kilogram range, um, except for when it gets into Kansas. This is later overnight into the uh, seven o'clock hours. Actually, it's not exactly overnight. It's more towards the sunset hours, uh, where it actually gets up to around 2,000 joules per kilogram. You can potentially see something within all of that. And then your thunderstorms develop. Notice how the cape goes away. Uh, that's because the thunderstorms actually eat the energy and it becomes um, mature and it actually allows it to sustain. So it's kind of like, um, there's another YouTuber that says this, but it's basically like food. These uh, thunderstorms need food and they need to uh, help it sustain. So that's a good analogy. I actually like that analogy um, in regards to what cape is like to a thunderstorm. But... Um, yep, there's a lot of energy here in uh, Kansas. There's also a lot of energy over in Oklahoma. So there's some areas that get up to 2,000, you know, 1,800. So there's a lot of energy here. There's even a lot of energy up in Nebraska. So definitely a lot of energy here for these thunderstorms. But the reason as to why nothing is going to happen in Oklahoma is because of the limiting factor. I'm going to show you all here what I mean by this. Uh, I'm looking at the significant tornado parameter, which takes into account of all different types of uh, 
of uh, things here that happened in the atmosphere. So wind shear, cape, capping, inversion, stuff like that. So there is, um, it's pretty decent here in Oklahoma, but the only issue is you have this capping inversion. So we're going to take a look at the skew T chart real quickly. Um, it's basically this box right here. And for you new guys who may just want to know what the weather is, you might just click on, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, I'm just going to click off the video. It's not that type of thing for me. And trust me, it's not that hard. I'll, I'll explain it to the best of my abilities, but personally, I think it's pretty simple. Even if, uh, you know, even if I've been doing this for quite a long time, it should be pretty simple to you once I explain it. So this red line right here is the temperature line. As it goes up with height, temperature obviously decreases. That's the reason why in valleys, it's typically warmer than when you're on top of a mountain. If you think of like Mount Everest, that place always has a bunch of snow and ice at the top of the mountain. Whereas if you go to the places around it in like the valleys and the cities, there isn't really because the climate is uh, a lot warmer than it is up top of the mountain. Your green line is the dew points. As I said, that's the moisture in the sky. So as that goes up, it gets drier. And then this dotted line right here, this is the pathway in which a thunderstorm would take in order to try and mature itself. So this is a developing thunderstorm or a developing parcel line. So any time into which the red line is over on the left side and the dotted line is on the right side, that in between here that is your convective available potential energy or cape now the opposite of cape in this case is your limiting factor also known as capping in aversion or cap as we like to call it so anytime this red line goes to the right of the dotted line this area right I'll actually uh, make this a different color here for you this uh, light blue this right here this is capping inversion and according to this sounding right here there is a lot of it typically you want under negative 60. so the fact that it is three times that amount tells me that it is there is a lot of limiting factors i mean if you think of it this way go go get out jeez my little brother has to come in the worst opportune times um anyways if you think of it this way Typically, thunderstorms start from the ground up because you have your warm air that's rising. So your warm air rises with your moisture, and that's where it all starts. But if you have something that limits it from stopping, kind of like a lid, it won't go anywhere. It will basically bank off, and it'll be trapped. Now, there are some instances where the capping inversion, if it gets below 60, to where it's almost as if you have a boiling pot of water and your lid basically pops off uh, because there's so much pressure that the steam just starts erupting through. In this case, there's too strong of a lid, so these thunderstorms cannot actually sustain. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. But otherwise, for the most part, this is a pretty good sounding. I mean, your hodograph, which basically tells you uh, if you had a weather balloon and you were to let it go from the ground and you were in a satellite you're, and you just looked down at that weather balloon, you'd be able to see in which directions it would go. So it looks like it goes up, which in this case it would be north. Then it turns to the right, which would go east. And then it does a little loop-de-loop -loop right here, goes to the east again, and then it goes south. So uh, what this entire thing right here, this tells us the spin in the atmosphere. And what we're looking at is for this red line. So whenever this red line curls off to the right, that tells you that there's a lot of spin in the lower parts of the atmosphere and which if you think of it if you ask you know, why do we need to look at the spin in the lower parts in the atmosphere well tornadoes typically happen at the ground and so we want to see what that spin is like in case of these tornadoes actually do form and uh, actually produce um, with these thunderstorms so just to think of that as well it's also relatively HP because you have a lot of this uh, extracurricular stuff in the higher parts of the atmosphere to where rain will just basically be excess and uh, not be as photogenic as people would like it to be so um, if there were any thunderstorms to develop off of this it wouldn't be all too good but uh, luckily we're not focusing on Oklahoma we're focusing on Nebraska and Kansas so let's take a sounding here right at the border of Kansas and Nebraska uh, you can see this photograph does curl to the right so there is a little bit of um, spin in the atmosphere your uh, dew points lack a little bit they're below 60 your cape is above 2000 so that's good 
Your capping inversion, I'll zoom in here for you. Your capping inversion is below negative 60, so that is very good. Your helicity, I don't talk about helicity a whole lot, but I focus on mainly these three things for beginners, um, or at least if you're a beginner, I recommend looking at those three things solely. Um, there's a process. I always look for energy, wind shear, capping inversion, all right? These three things down here at the bottom is mainly the big wind shear that I look at for lower level rotation. You can take a look at 500 millibar wind shear and stuff like that as well. But for lower level rotation, this is what I look for. So your, uh, your shear at surface to one kilometer is 18. That's pretty good. Typically, you want it to be around 20 or something like that, but it's still not bad. Your surface to three kilometer wind shear is 29. Around 28 is what I would like. And uh, because it's over that, that's pretty good wind shear. However, your helicity is uh, 173, and that's not too good. You typically want this to be around 200. Um, it's around, it's getting closer to 200, so you might actually get something from this. Um, but your helicity, if it was much closer to 200, I would actually uh, be pretty concerned about the threat for tornadoes within this event. But your cape is good, your capping inversion is good, your shear lacks a little bit, your... Uh, Lapse rates, which just look at updrafts for uh, hail and maybe a little bit for tornadoes, is pretty good. Anytime, uh, I typically look at this amount right here. And so um, anytime it's below 6.5, that's when you start to get into the danger zone of some storms not being able to uh, produce larger amounts of hail or maybe even sustain updrafts. Uh, but because it is 8.4 and 7.3, um, you shouldn't have any issues with thunderstorms sustaining. So that's practically the environment. Uh, in Kansas. As a matter of fact, if I take another sounding here and say uh, central Kansas um, or south central Kansas, actually, it's practically the same thing, uh, except there's a lot more capping inversion, um, but it's still, you know, not a bad environment for these storms. So that's uh, that's one thing to note here. Uh, if you live in central Kansas all the way up into Nebraska, into the South Dakota, Iowa region, that's where you can definitely see some stronger amounts of these storms all right let's take a look at the five percent this is the main threat that we're going to be uh talking about now it's not going to be as long as what i just discussed with our past event because i was mainly explaining to you all uh what each thing means so now it's going to be kind of like a lightning round i'll go pew 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 true facts anyways uh that was cringe feel free to unsubscribe i'm just kidding please don't please subscribe anyways um so Let's take a look at the timings here for you all, uh, be able to show you as to when these storms will start to march on through uh, within these areas. So um, this is Wednesday morning, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, all the way over towards uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 13, did I just say 13 o'clock? Something's wrong with me. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, around the 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock hours is when thunderstorms can develop. Especially, especially around places like Joplin, all the way over to Fort Smith, uh, maybe even towards the Texarkana region. So those areas definitely need to start monitoring that. But uh, in my opinion, that's not the major threat, uh, or at least the time of day in which it's the major threat. It'll occur later on in the day, and you'll see why. Uh, thunderstorms will continue to develop. They'll move past Springfield uh, at around, say, 2 o'clock, give or take, um, as well as Shreveport. Uh, that'll continue to move on through and then this is where you can see a lot more of your thunderstorms that begin to develop you start seeing thunderstorms up in iowa moving down through in uh past kansas city all the way down to shreveport uh more thunderstorms begin to develop and they start to really push on through little rock pine bluff you guys start to see thunderstorms at four o'clock um jefferson city same thing four o'clock this will continue to push on through and it continues to move all the way out into the night this is six o'clock here and uh, Memphis is already seeing thunderstorms. Um, you know, most of the areas in Iowa, they're starting to see thunderstorms, including Quad Cities. Uh, as it continues to push on through Pine Bluff, you're still not out of it. Um, the good news for that is that Little Rock, you guys are out of it by uh, by seven or eight o'clock, right around that time zone or time frame is when you guys are mainly done. St. Louis, you guys start to get into this action at around eight or nine o'clock right around those hours um jackson Tupel uh, jackson mississippi tupelo mississippi you guys start to see some general rain showers at around that time frame you know this line just starts to push on through and you can see all these little embedded cells within the line here these could potentially be tornadic i mean there's a wide 
uh, wide area to where you can see some tornadic cells here. We'll actually get into the uh, in-depth analysis here in a second, but you'll actually be able to see uh, here, there's these discrete cells which can produce some quick spin-ups along the line, maybe some quick tornadoes uh, that can form uh, along this QLCS or quasi-linear convective system. Uh, so something to keep in mind with that. All right, let's take a look at our moisture here, dew points. Um, the dew points here are in the 60s in the most spots. As a matter of fact, there's some areas that get into the mid to upper 60s. This is uh, 4 o'clock in some of these areas, and look at this. 60s here you have your strong dry line which can uh, force thunderstorms to begin to initiate that big inversion between uh, warm air rising cold air sinking that's usually how thunderstorms begin to begin to develop so uh, whenever you see that dry line there that typically means that uh, cold air is associated with associated with it you can start seeing uh, some thunderstorms that can begin to develop along that line so uh, some of these areas here uh, especially into places like Missouri, Iowa, Arkansas, even into Texas and Louisiana. You guys are in the mid-60s, maybe low 60s in some spots, but mid-upper 60s, especially in Texas. A lot of moisture here, and that'll stay all the way throughout the evening. Your CAPE, your convective available energy, uh, for the most part within the day, it's uh, somewhat modest. There's some areas that can get into the yellows. You see that it actually gets up to 2,000 joules per kilogram. But for the most part, it's relatively modest. You have some amounts of energy. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it's uh, around 2,000 joules per kilogram, maybe even a little bit under in some areas, except for places near Quad Cities, northern Illinois. You guys actually can see higher amounts of Cape in there. Um, but there actually isn't um, as much of a tornado risk within that general vicinity. And I'll take a sounding here to uh, explain why. So if you take a look here, your hodograph is a hodgepodge. I'm, uh, I think that's the best way to describe it. It's a hodgepodge. So that's the reason why there isn't really a tornado th threat. You don't see this red line. I'll zoom it in for you here real quickly. This red line doesn't really turn off to the right. It goes up, and then it goes back down. So not really a huge tornado risk up in uh, northern Illinois. But you have all this energy and all this wind shear that I am almost certain that you guys could see a hail and damaging wind threat. I'd say more or less a hail threat for you guys. Your lapse rates are near seven, so that could definitely contribute to uh, some larger amounts of hail. So definitely something to where if you live in the Midwest, uh, in those areas, you need to monitor that heavily. Um, and then this is, um, I'm gonna start taking soundings for some other areas uh, as well here in a second. We'll take a look at our significant tornado parameter, which uh, gives us the worst case scenario here. So I'll just uh, quickly zoom on through. There we are. Um, and you can see some of these areas in the blues, they can indicate that there is a slight chance of some tornadoes. Um, some of the grays is a smaller chance, and then the white, obviously, name and tails, there is none. Um, but there is a little bit of an area here in southern, uh, southern Missouri, northern Arkansas. We'll start from there, move our way down. Skinny Cape, I mean, it's forecast to be around 2,000 joules per kilogram, so it's all right. Your hodograph curls off to the right, so that is good. There is spin in the atmosphere, which tells me that there is uh, the potential for tornadic systems. Capping inversion is minimal, so that's something there. Your surface uh, surface of 3-kilometer lapse rate is all right. It's a little bit above 6.5, so you could have some things that can sustain. Your 3- to 6-kilometer lapse rates are 7.7, though, which tells me that uh, there could be a chance for some larger amounts of hail, especially with... Uh, a bit of a dry spike here, which can contribute to large hail uh, in some thunderstorms. So at around 700 to 500 millibars, that's where your dry spike is. So there could be some larger amounts of hail with the system. Um, we'll move on over to the shear aspect for you all. Uh, your helicity is over 200, which means that it is good enough for uh, some tornadic development right here. 200, um, your shear at Surface of one kilometer is 30, your surface of three kilometers is 40. So I'd say it does have some good tornadic potential here uh, with these systems. One thing I do want to note is that it might be a little bit HP because the latter part of the hodograph actually gets into the way of storm motion. So um, the best way for people to view this system would be due south of this, uh, uh, due south of the actual mesocyclone, because otherwise uh, there would be some lingering showers and some rain that would be within the inflow notch. So that's something to keep in mind there. Uh, moving further south into Arkansas, we'll take a look at the conditions here. Uh, Central Arkansas, skinny cape, as I said, the hodograph still curls off to the right, so that is a good enough sounding for me. 
your lapse rates at surface to three kilometer is pretty poor. Uh, five to six kilometer, um, so three to five, three to six kilometer, I should say, is eight. But your surface to three kilometer is five point six. That is very bad. So, uh, in regards to sustainability for updrafts, that has to be put in question. I hope that there isn't anything that sustains so that the people of Arkansas uh, get more of a break than. Uh, what they've been getting so far, but one thing I will say is that your helicity is pretty high your shear is pretty high So that if there is thunderstorms that develop there very well could be a tornado chance with this. Uh, it is a little bit up um, Elevated though your rotation uh, very well could be uh, very much so elevated. So uh, The chance for tornadoes might not be too strong in Arkansas. Uh, it will definitely be uh, Stronger later on in the evening. I will say that much um, but for central Arkansas, like near Little Rock, it looks to be a little bit less, so that's something to keep in mind. And then uh, let's take a look at Louisiana here. There's this glaring red here, and yeah, look at that sounding. Very skinny cape, but it's forecasted to be uh, above 2,000 joules per kilogram, so not that big of an issue here. Uh, but still, over 2,000 joules per kilogram here. Lapse rates, as I said, kind of suffer a little bit, but 7 uh, 7.6 on the uh, surface, or the uh, 3 to 6 kilometer lapse rates there, so it's not that bad. You're... Uh, Dew points are good. Your helicity is phenomenal. It's 306, uh, almost 360 with your shear uh, at higher amounts. At uh, one, uh, up to one kilometer is 37, up to three kilometers is 50. So that is really good there. And then your uh, hodograph just looks absolutely amazing. That is a, uh, a strong hodograph right there. So would not be surprised if storms uh, decided to develop off of that. Maybe even a couple supercells that uh, developed off of those cells. Um, around the four o'clock hours in Louisiana then as we move it further on into the evening this is the reason why I say the event is going to uh, basically amplify itself later on uh, into the overnight hours this starts to move into Mississippi at around nine eight nine ten o'clock this is a sounding here that I'll take it is a bit capped it has a negative 61 uh, capping inversion so it's right on the border if uh, it can break through it which I uh, it don't have to be along the dry line in order to do so um, if it does break, then for the most part, it does look pretty good. Your helicity is good. Your shear is good. Um, your lapse rates are all right. They're in the sixes for the most part. Surface to three kilometers in the uh, uh, higher amounts. Your hodograph is all right. It doesn't curl off as well as I like it to be, but it still does have that tornadic potential there. Uh, and then as you continue to go on through into Mississippi, it actually gets a whole lot better. Uh, later on in the evening, so it'll be uh, worse as time goes along overnight. So that is something to really monitor as this event uh, pushes on through into the evening. So if you were to take anything from this video, uh, it's that this is take two of this video. I know it's super late. Uh, I know it's super long, but uh, the event today, which would be Tuesday, we'll see some large hail and gusty winds, small chance for tornadoes, but that would be in Kansas and Nebraska. Um, yeah, so large, some spotty hails, maybe large hail and some gusty winds over there. And then a uh, amplified risk for tornadoes um, in a widespread region on Wednesday, which could include places like Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, maybe even Texas. But something that we really need to monitor as time goes along here. So anyways, guys, that's going to be it for me. If you guys did enjoy the content, please be sure to like the video, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications, share this with friends and family and on social media. Follow me on social media, including places like Twitter, Twitch, and go join my Discord server. I said we had a class tonight at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Discord for uh, radar analysis. So if you have radar scope or GR2 analysts, uh, which if you don't have radar scope i highly uh, advise that you do purchase it i'm not sponsored by them but it's ten dollars and it gives you all the things you need to know about what's happening with live radar so ten dollar purchase there you go radar scope uh and then you can join the class tonight uh, it'll be in one of our voice chats so please be ready for that as i said eight o'clock eastern daylight time don't miss it i'll be the host of the event and i'll make sure that all your questions are answered and that we uh, learn a few my name is Nate. I also go by Hockey Boy and Nate. I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Peace.